Good evening. Welcome to the University Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study for Wednesday, September 7th, 2022. Uh, we'd like to welcome all who are here, those who are members of the University Church of Christ here in Cleveland, Ohio, as well as those from our sister congregations in the greater Cleveland area uh, in Northeast Ohio, as well as in the state of Ohio, around the country and around the world. I'm Terrence McLean, ministering evangelist on behalf of my beloved wife, Sister Linda McLean, on behalf of our elders, uh, Brother Frank Barnes and Brother Donald Nelson and Brother Greg Shields and their wives and families, uh, on behalf of our deacons, Brother Freddie Gibson and Brother Anthony Slade, their wives and their families, and on behalf of all of the members of the University Church of Christ, we thank you for joining us as we study together from God's holy and divine word on tonight. Uh, we want to read a few announcements and open with prayer. Uh, again, we are sorry to inform you that our dear sister Dorothy Shields has transitioned from this life to the next. She has passed away. Uh, our condolences to Belinda and Bert and Barry. Uh, as well as the rest of the Shields family, and also our condolences uh, to us as the University Church of Christ Church family. Uh, the memorial service will be this coming Saturday, September 10th, uh, at the University Church of Christ building, located at 1885 East 89th Street, uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio. It will begin at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, for those who are going to be transporting food, uh, food and cards can go to Sister Belinda Shields uh, at 515 East 250th Street uh, in Euclid, Ohio, 44132. And if you want to take food to the family, there will be other family members arriving in town beginning on tomorrow and food to be dropped off on this coming Friday is after 5 o'clock p.m. at the home of Brother Barry Shields at 12006 Mount Overlook, Cleveland, Ohio, 44120. Again, that food to Barry's house for the family is to be Friday after 5 o'clock, but up until that time, between now and then, uh, you can drop food off at Sister Belinda Shields' home, or you can send cards and condolences to Sister Shields and the family at the 515 East 250th Street, Euclid, Ohio, 44132. Also, our condolences go out to Brother Alan Severos and his family uh, and the loss of his niece, we received word on yesterday uh, that uh, Sister Boyd, uh, the widow of uh, Brother Vernon Boyd, who had been the longtime minister there uh, at the Oakland Church of Christ, uh, has transitioned. She passed away on yesterday, and so we are lifting the Boyd family as well as the Oakland Church of Christ there in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, before God's throne is gra of grace as as well. Uh, we are asking for traveling grace for Sister Doris Smith. Uh, Brother Robert Cunningham would like to thank the church for the prayers for uh, his biological brother and our brother in Christ, Norby Cunningham, who had surgery on September 1st. It was a success. Uh, Brother Norby, great gospel preacher, uh, is recuperating at the hospital in Nacogdoches, Texas. So we want to continue to remember the Cottingham family and especially Brother Norby in prayer. Uh, continued prayers for the health and strength of Sister Margaret Martin, uh, Sister Constance Williams, Sister Nicole Bird, Brother Wayne Brown, Brother Melvin Flowers, Brother Kevin Edmondson, Sister Patricia Gaines, and Brother Sanford Davis. Uh, Brother Raymond and Sister Linda Knight, uh, Sister Ruth Wade, 
uh, Brother Bentley's nephew, Keith, uh, Brother George McCall, uh, Sister Denise Draper's father, Mr. Lacey, Sister Marilyn Stewart, Sister Mildred Brown, and Brother Brown as well, Brother Curtis Jones, Sister Emma Brown, Sister Jill King, uh, Brother Anthony Thomas, Sister Michelle Thomas, Tyler Mora, Sister Vanita Brown, and Sister Emma Brown. And we want to pray for Sister Emma's great-grandson, Demario Brown, who will be having surgery. And we want to, of course, want to continue to pray for Sister Julia Hicks, uh, who is in Menorah Park uh, Senior Citizens Center. Uh, continue to pray for those who have requested prayer for their health and those who will have medical procedures. Again, continue to pray for all of those who have lost family members. Remember to pray for all our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, all those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. And we want to, of course, continue to pray for the Church of Christ family as a whole, uh, its ministries and our spiritual strength in the Lord as he continues to use us, his body, to advance his kingdom. Uh, continue to pray for our leadership, myself as the ministering evangelist, our elders, our deacons, uh, as we continue to work together to provide uh, the nourishment, the spiritual instruction for all of those who have God has placed under our, our watchful care. Uh, we not only want to pray for the leadership, the entire membership, and the entire body of Christ all around the world. And in addition to uh, the list that I've been given, we also want to lift Sister Sharon Foster in prayer as that God will bless her uh, in her health and, and give her strength as well. So at this time, if you would, would you join with me as we, we go to God, God in prayer. Gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, you are holy and righteous and just but you're also merciful and gracious and we on uh, this evening uh, just thank you for your grace and mercy uh, it's your grace and your mercy that has brought us safe thus far uh, your grace is amazing because you are an amazing god the s songwriter said amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you for your amazing grace. You gave Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. You raised him for our justification, and he's on your right hand, making intercession for us, even as we lift this prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway, and our prayer is that I will handle it aright on this evening so that those who hear will be strengthened and encouraged and built up in the most holy and precious faith who are your children and those who have not yet accepted the gift of salvation through your son Jesus. May they be pricked in their hearts, search the scriptures to see whether those things are so that we talk about and respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Be with all of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, but we are especially mindful of the family of Sister Dorothy Shields, our beloved Sister Shields. We are mindful of the University Church of Christ family. Uh, we are mindful of the Boyd family, as well as the Oakland Church of Christ family there in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, we are mindful of of the Oakland Church and that their minister, Brother Ed, Ed Cripps, uh, his father passed away a while ago. Uh, we are mindful of the Sims family in Detroit and we ask you to be with them uh, as Brother Brian and his sisters will be funeralizing his brother, uh, his father, uh, in the next few days as well. Father, just comfort us as only you can because you're the God of all comfort. Be with all of the sick individuals that we have called the names of. Be with those that are sick that we may not even be aware of. Uh, not only members of the University Church family, but 
members of the body of Christ in greater Cleveland, uh, in the state of Ohio, in this country, and not only those who are your children, but just those who are sick and struggling uh, with pain and sorrow and frustration, uh, help us to help them to know there is a different and a better way. There is one who has said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly and that I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the door. And of course, I'm talking about your son, our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we lift this prayer in his name asking you to forgive us of our sins, which you bless our study now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight, we're going to be studying from the Gospel of Mark and the 10th, 10th chapter. And we're going to be studying from verses 32 all the way down to the end of the chapter, to verse number 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through, through 52. As we study this section of, of the Gospel of Mark, and and this section of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, uh, if you will want to put a title to this study, uh, it would be Mark's third prediction of Christ's death. Mark's third prediction. Now, some commentaries and some scholarly books would say Mark's third prediction of the passion. Uh, of the Christ and the passion of the Christ of course talks about all that Jesus endured uh, leading up to Calvary and those hours just before the Garden of Gethsemane his unjust trials and then his hanging there on Golgotha but to keep it at least for you to remember we're going to just call it Mark's third prediction of Christ's death. This is the last time that Jesus, as he approached Jerusalem, told his disciples that he would die and rise again. Each time Jesus gave them more information than he had given before. The first time the disciples reacted violently in Mark chapter 8 and verse number 32, where we read, and, they, and he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to, to rebuke him. The second time they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him for an explanation. So we read in Matthew, Mark chapter 9, verse 32, but they understood not that, that saying and were afraid to ask him. Now that saying is what he mentioned in verse 31. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Isn't it interesting that to us that's clear, but they didn't fully understand what that saying meant and yet the Holy Spirit says they were afraid to ask him. But now when we get to Mark chapter 10, the third time, Mark recorded no reaction to Jesus' announcement except that an argument about who would be the greatest in the earthly kingdom followed immediately. Now remember, the Jews were looking for an earthly kingdom. Clearly, the disciples did not comprehend what was coming, and they certainly didn't understand their roles in the coming kingdom. Nevertheless, Jesus continued to teach them lessons of discipleship that they, they needed. 
And so verse number 32 begins the third major prophecy of Jesus' death. Verse 32 through 34, and it is a parallel passage to Matthew 20, verse 17 through 19, as well as Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through 34. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 32, the Bible says this. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Verse 33, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes. And... They shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles and they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus and his disciples were traveling to Jerusalem from somewhere in Perea, or what is called Eastern Judea. They had not yet passed through Jericho, because we're going to read about that in verses 46 through 52. And Jesus' position ahead of them, in typical rabbinic fashion, suggests his determination to go to Jerusalem in spite of his coming death there. In Mark chapter 14, verse number 28, the Bible says that Jesus said to them, but after that I am risen, I will go before you unto Galilee. This was after the institution of the Lord's Supper. They sung a hymn. They went out into the Mount of Olives, and he told them that they would be offended because of him before the night is over and because the shepherd will be taken, the sheep would be scattered. And then, of course, we see in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, uh, that as he walked with those, or as he talked to Mary Magdalene, he says in verse 7, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. This is one of the angels. There shall ye see him as he said unto, unto you. You will see him. There is something about this prediction of Jesus. Uh, you can't see this because uh, I don't have PowerPoint up, but, uh, but there's a chart that I have that illustrates the greater detail of, of the prediction concerning uh, Jesus' death and, and, and his suffering. Uh, there are six things on this chart. He's handed over to the Sanhedrin uh, in the second prediction in chapter 9, verse 30, through chapter 10, verse 31. Uh, it's also mentioned in the third prediction in chapter 10, verse 32 through 52. And then again, it's mentioned in what we call the passion or the actual suffering of Christ in chapter 14, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 47. So that's, it's not a part of the first prediction, but it's part of the second, third, and the fourth prediction. Condemnation by the Sanhedrin is a part of the first prediction and a part of the third and the fourth prediction. Uh, handing him over to the Romans is a part of the third prediction, and of course his passion narrative. Uh, mocking and spitting and scourging are a part of the first prediction, the third prediction, and of course a part of the passion narrative. His execution is a part of the first 
prediction in chapter 8, verse 31, and the second prediction in chapter 9, verse 31, the third prediction in verse 34 of chapter 10, which we just read, and then, of course, it's in the Passion narrative in chapter 15, verse 24 and verse 37. And then, of course, there's resurrection. It's a part of the first prediction, the second prediction, the third prediction, and of course, a part of the Passion narrative. And since there is such a remarkable correspondence between these predictions and, and their fulfillment in what we call the Passion narrative, there are some people who believe that Jesus could not have predicted them. This is one of the reasons I really believe that the Bible is the word of, of God, that it has been given by inspiration of God, because since all of them were fulfilled, then the only explanation is that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were orchestrating what was happening for the salvation of mankind. And even if Jesus hadn't predicted all of these things, Jesus, since he knew what was in man, certainly anticipated the depth of the religious leader's antagonism against him, and he understood the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah, and of course he says that he is the Messiah. One scholar says Jerusalem is a place of danger and condemnation to death in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' enemies are at home here, and from here scribes and Pharisees come to Galilee to attack him and his disciples. And the temple, the house of God, the place where God's presence is, and the seat of the religious authority power is a place of intense conflict. Prior to his passion, prior to his scourging, his beating, his suffering, and then, of course, his crucifixion, Jesus' last great confrontation with the religious authorities occurs in the temple where supposedly the presence of God was. And I just want you to think about that. I think sometimes when we, we read about the suffering of Christ, we, we believe that it was done maybe in, in just general areas uh, of the city or out in what you might call the public places, but much of what he suffered happened in the place that was dedicated to God. So Jesus has predicted his, his suffering. But then we move on from verse number 34, and, and, and the next 10 verses are important because with his anticipating his suffering, and one of the things that you will read about in, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, about the paradox of authority and servanthood, and Jesus talks about that a lot in the Gospel of Mark, even though he's anticipating going to the cross, he takes time to teach us about serving. Now, this really caught my attention in preparation for, for tonight's study. Watch this in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 
And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized withal shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now this section parallels Mark 9 verses 30 through 37. Both of these sections deal with true greatness and yet both of them follow predictions about Jesus' suffering and death, his passion. The second incident shows the disciples their lack of spiritual perception and their selfishness even more than the first one. Now remember this. Jesus has just told them I am going to be mocked, I am going to be scourged, I am going to be spit upon, I'm going to be condemned to death, I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles. And immediately after he makes that announcement, here comes James and John wanting position in the coming kingdom. Well, that's not enough because the other ten are indignant because James and John beat them to it. All of this is going on right after Jesus told them about his upcoming suffering. And before we conclude that the disciples were particularly stupid, and not understanding what Jesus has just predicted, we need to remember the culture in which they lived. In their culture, events were more important than time, as is true of most Eastern cultures. They were so focusing on the upcoming event of the inauguration of what they believed was the earthly kingdom as they thought and their places in it that the time of Jesus' arrest, death, and resurrection did not make an impression on them. I want you to stop to think about us in 2022 in the Lord's charge. How often do we get caught up in this same kind of stuff within local congregations and lose sight of the bigger picture. The sinfulness of mankind, the enormity of the sacrifice that was made so that we could be saved. We even talk about 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper, when we partake of it, we do show forth the Lord's death and suffering till he come, and yet over the years I have actually seen people partake of that Lord's Supper and then literally go after one another when it's all said and done. Hmm. James and John's request seems almost incredible. 
they wanted Jesus to give them whatever they requested. And when asked what that might be, they explained that they wanted the positions of highest honor in Jesus' coming kingdom. The person who sat on a ruler's right-hand side enjoyed the highest assigned position. And the person who sat on his left, the second highest in that culture. These brothers obviously believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they thought that he was going to establish his earthly kingdom soon, probably when they reached Jerusalem. Now this was a little different than how it is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew wrote that their mother, Salome, the sister of Jesus' mother, voiced their request for them in Matthew 20 and verse 20. But Mark puts the words in their own mouths, possibly because the request came from their hearts, even though Salome spoke them. And perhaps they thought their family connection with Jesus justified their request because James and John were Jesus' cousins. If Salome was the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary, then James and John were Jesus' cousins. So they were trying to pull rank, much like we do in the Lord's church. Don't you know the church started in my family's house, or, or my grandfather was this, or my father was this, or my brother was this, and, and, and don't you know who I am? In order for us to try to get some privilege. Frequently, rulers appointed close family members to important government positions. We see it even in our own uh, secular government right here in this country. And one scholar says this narrative contains a bright mirror of human vanity for it shows that proper and holy zeal is often accompanied by ambition. Mm. They who are not satisfied with himself alone, talking about Christ, but seek this or the other thing apart from him and his promises Wander egregiously from the right path. I have really come to understand that most people don't want God. They don't want a relationship with God. They don't want a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They want what God can give them, but they don't want God. And that's true outside of the body of Christ as well as inside of the body of Christ. So as long as God is blessing us with what we think we want, he's a good God. But let the winds blow in our lives or troubles come or calamity comes or pain or grief or sorrow come. Then all of a sudden, God is not as good as we once declared he was, if he's still God. And so Jesus says to them in verse 38 through, through 40, you, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall you be baptized? Jesus said to them, and he really says to you and I, those who share Jesus' honor, in the coming kingdom must also share his sufferings in this age. The cup often is a symbol of trouble and suffering in, in the Old Testament. Uh, you can see that in Psalm 75 and, and verse number 8. Psalm chapter 75 and verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof are all, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. It, it's trouble and suffering. In Isaiah chapter 51, just to notice another text. Verse number 17, 
Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung, wrung them out. Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse number 12. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken, and art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. It's a symbol of trouble and suffering, even though sometimes it does represent joy, as in Psalm 23 and verse 5. And so when he talks about this cup, are you going to drink of the suffering that I'm getting ready to go through? Brothers and sisters, to this day, and I have seen it on a couple of occasions, but I struggle to get through Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ mm -hmm. to this very day. And what really gets to me is that based on Isaiah's prophecy about the suffering Christ and other Old Testament prophets, as gruesome and graphic as Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ was as far as what Jesus went through, in reality, it doesn't even come close. Because if we read the Old Testament prophecies correctly, Jesus was going to be so scourged and beat that he was unrecognizable. So when Isaiah says, you know, there was no beauty that we should desire him, it is not talking about how handsome he was, that he was an ugly man, and so that's why we didn't desire him. No, what it's talking about is what he went through was so devastating, he was disfigured. So when he talks about being baptized, with whether, are you going to be overwhelmed with trouble being my follower? Yeah, there is a baptism that you are going to get, but it, it, it's not even close to what, what he had to go through. James and John confidently and naively affirmed that they could endure all the trouble and suffering that Jesus would have to endure because they did not understand what he had predicted about his passion. In their desire for prominence, they were willing to promise Jesus anything. They would indeed experience a measure of suffering themselves as Jesus' disciples, but not as much as Jesus would have to endure. James was the first apostle to experience martyrdom in Acts chapter 12 and verse 2. And John may have been the last of the 12 to die. It's that John that God gave the book of Revelation at the closing of the pages of inspiration while he was out on the Isle of Patmos. One scholar says, though it is Christ's prerogative to assign to citizens their places in his kingdom, it is not in his power to dispose of places by partiality and patronage or otherwise than in accordance with fixed principles of justice and the sovereign ordination of his father. Remember, Jesus is the only one who ever walked this earth who said, I do always those things that please my father. Every time I run across that verse, I have to stop and take a deep breath. Because there's not another living soul who has lived before now, who is living right now, and who will be living when Jesus comes back, who can say, I do always those things that please my Father. Jesus says, I don't do it by partiality or patronage. 
And when it comes to this matter of salvation, it, it really is. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, God is no respecter of persons thinking that God has to give them some of the gifts that he gave the apostles and, and those in the first century. When the text in talking about God is no respecter of persons, is talking about in this matter of salvation. In this matter of salvation, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Greek. It doesn't matter whether you are bond or free, that you are male or female, that we have all been made one in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we all have to do the same thing in order to respond to the gift of salvation that we read about and we hear about in the gospel. Jesus' answer once again displays his supernatural knowledge. Yeah, you will be suffering, but it won't even come close. The other disciples, they're just like human beings in 2022. Their jealous reaction in verses 41 through 44 shows that selfish ambition motivated them as well as James and John. Jesus had to repeat his teaching about greatness because they hadn't learned the lesson in chapter 9, verse 33 through 37. And, and I want to read that into your hearing so you can see what he told them even before we get to this point. And he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? That alone ought to scare some of us. Because that means they didn't think that he did, but he knew what they were arguing about. And he already knew, he asked them, but he already knew they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Remember, they didn't tell him. They didn't open their mouth. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Now, from my perspective, that's pretty clear. That Jesus told him very plain that you want to be first, then you got to be last. You want to be great, then be a servant. Rule and authority in the kingdom come as a result of faithful and humble service in this present age. The disciples needed to concentrate on present service rather than future honor. The godless world focuses on the benefits of position. But disciples of Jesus should concentrate on qualifying for honor. The godless, the rulers of the Gentiles, even exercise authority prematurely by lording it over others. Don't we see that happening in politics in our country right now? But Jesus says disciples should voluntarily place themselves under others to help them. A slave. And the word in verse number 44 that is translated slave or, or servant is doulos. A slave was sometimes one who voluntarily sacrificed his or her rights 
to serve to serve others. Most slaves, however, were not voluntary servants. The Greek word signifies subjection, but not necessarily bondage. Think about the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse number 24 through 30. This is Luke's account of the same kind of situation. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serveth. We always talk about one and it be like Jesus. Jesus says, I am among you, not as the one that sits to be served, but I am among ye as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Notice what Jesus says. It shall not be so among, among you. Sometimes we really act more like the world in the body of Christ than we are willing to confess. We get hung up on titles, position, authority. And we'll even tear up the Lord's church of a local congregation if we can't get our way. Jesus says how they behave in the world is not the way you're going to behave in my coming kingdom. Now notice that Jesus did not rebuke the disciples for wanting to be great in the coming kingdom. This ambition is good. He corrected them for focusing on self-centered goals rather than on unselfish goals. And he clarified the method for obtaining greatness. You want to be great? The idea is this. Earthly kingdoms are ruled by a class of persons who possess hereditary reign, the aristocracy, nobles, or princes. The governing class are those whose birthright it is to rule and whose boast it is never to have been in a servile position, but always to have been served. In my kingdom, on the other hand, a man becomes a great one and a ruler by being first the servant of those over whom he is to bear rule. Here is the paradox of, king, of the kingdom of God, another scholar says. Instead of being lords with a little L, its great ones become servants, and its chiefs the bond servants of all. And he gives us the reason for this in verse 45 of Mark chapter 10. Notice he says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 
Even the Son of Man had to follow the rule that Jesus just explained. He's the great example of it. His incarnation, that means him coming to live in human flesh, was not that of a ruler whom others had to serve but that of a servant who met the needs of others. And Jesus' service extended to giving his life as a ransom, Matthew 20 and verse 28. In Koine Greek, which is the common Greek of the New Testament world, this word often described the money paid for the release of slaves. In the New Testament, it has a narrower, more theological meaning. Namely, it means release or redemption. The only two occurrences of this word in the New Testament are in Matthew 20, 28, and then again right here in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Exodus event in the Old Testament is an instance of this Redemption and release. And so here in Mark 10.45, when it says for, it's the Greek word anti, it means instead of or in place of, not on behalf of, it's a clear reference that Jesus is going to be our substitute. He took your place. He took my place on that cross. See, he not only paid the debt, he took our place. Hmm. And notice verse 45 says, he gave his life a ransom for, for many. The many here in verse 45 contrasts with the one who makes the payment, who is Jesus. The point is that one man's act affected many others. And the many does not contrast to the all. While Jesus' death benefits everyone in one sense and only the elect in another sense, that was not the point of Jesus' contrast here. Jesus took the place of everyone else by paying the penalties for their sins. I don't know if this this is this this really comes close. Uh, I know when I was growing up, and I had a brother and two sisters, and we loved each other, though we we were siblings. However, I don't ever recall any of us being willing to take a whooping for everyone else. Now we may have. I just don't remember that. I'm trying to be honest here. I, I just don't remember that. I, I remember many times when something was done and got broken or whatever, that when Daddy asked us, we immediately pointed out to they Terry did it, Jerry did it, or if they called our name and they had a certain tone in their voice. See, our nicknames were Terry, Jerry, Sherry, and Mary. And if they called our names and we didn't hear the first consonant, we all went running. But we tried to make sure we understood what that first consonant was because that meant you were in trouble. And we would say, yo, daddy, won't you? Now, yeah, he was still our daddy. But when it comes to this thing called sin, it's not our human nature. To say that I'm going to die for you. I'm going to take your punishment. My wife says her brother Frankie took a whipping for all of them. And, and, and praise my, my, my brother Frankie. God bless his soul. I'm just being honest. I don't remember us ever taking one. We may have, but I just don't remember. But when it comes to your being saved, and my being saved, I hope you understand that Jesus experienced your hell and my hell 
so that we wouldn't have to go there. This verse in verse 45 is not only the climax of this section of the book, it's really the key verse of Mark, Mark's gospel that, that the Son of Man, the suffering servant of the Lord, it summarizes his ministry, which was Mark's particular emphasis. It constituted another announcement of Jesus' coming death. But now it adds the purpose for his dying, which had not been previously revealed in the predictions of his death. This verse contains the clear statement of the object of Christ's coming found in the Gospels. But this theological declaration was made to enforce a practical truth for everyday conduct in our lives. That John finally got the message about the importance of humility is clear from what he wrote in 1 John 3 and verse 16. He laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. One version says, he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. You see, there, there is a difference between a helper and a servant. A helper helps others when it is convenient. A servant serves others even when it is inconvenient. A helper helps people that he or she likes. A servant serves even people that he or she dislikes. A helper helps when he or she enjoys the work. A servant serves even when he or she dislikes the work. A helper helps with a view to obtaining personal satisfaction. A servant serves even when he or she receives no personal satisfaction. A helper helps with an attitude of assisting another. A servant serves with an attitude of enabling another. Contrast between a helper and a servant. Mm -hmm. I have in all my, my years of ministry always attempted to be a servant. So when, when I say to you, remember God loves you, Jesus died for you, I love you, and I am your servant for Jesus' sake. This is what I have in mind. Mm -hmm. I really want to be a servant like Jesus. Not just a helper. I want to be a servant. I don't care about position. I want to please God and I want to please him. And then there's a last thing in this chapter and I'm going to close. And believe it or not, all these first two parts were designed to get us to this part. The healing of a blind man ends this chapter. And verses 45 through 50, 52, or 46, I'm sorry, through 52. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou... Son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise. He calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? 
the blind man, blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Matthew has a, a, a similar narrative in Matthew 20, verse 29 through 34. And Luke has a similar one in Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Mark probably included this incident in his gospel because it illustrates how Jesus would open the spiritual eyes of his disciples, which, remember, were still shut. Remember he told them in nine about, chapter 9 about being a servant, and being like children to, in order to be great. They still don't get it when he talks about his passion, his suffering, his death to come. So now here is this man who is literally blind. This is the last healing miracle that Mark recorded. The second account of the blind being healed. There was one in chapter 8, verse 22 through 26. Concludes this central section of Mark. And it serves as bookends of this section. Recorded as they were and where they were may be suggestive of the trouble the spiritually blind disciples were having and grasping the need for the death of Christ and the need for faithfulness in taking a stand for Christ in the midst of opposition. This passage is the only place in the Gospel of Mark where someone called Jesus Son of David. And that Jesus accepted this title and healed the man is evidence that he affirmed the truth, that he is indeed the Messiah. Jericho stood about five miles west of the Jordan River and six miles north of the Dead Sea. There is discussion about whether he was going into Jericho, going through Jericho, whether he was leaving Jericho. There is a lot of, of descriptions or discussion about it among, among scholars, but for the lack of time, I won't go into that discussion. I had a brief one here. Uh, I have another 10 or 11 page document that I read through. But one of the things that is important that I really want to focus on is, is Bartimaeus. Two descriptions of Jesus in these Verses reveal the faith of this blind man. Mm -hmm. Bartimaeus had obviously heard about Jesus. And he had concluded that he was the Messiah. Thou son of David. The son of David. Son of David is a messianic title. Mark uses it in chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. Also in chapter 12, verse 35 through 37. That's in Mark. In the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 7, verse 8 through 16. 2 Samuel 7, verse 8 through 16. Isaiah 11, verse 1. In Isaiah 11, verse 10, that's Isaiah 11, verse 1, Isaiah 11, verse 10, and Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, and then Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 23 and 24, Ezekiel 34, verses 23 and 24. Son of David is used in those texts. It's a messianic title. Mm -hmm. And even though Bartimaeus lacked physical sight, he saw more clearly who Jesus was than the multitudes who could see. Mm -hmm. His cry for mercy from Jesus expressed the attitude of trust, humility, and dependence that Jesus had been teaching his disciples to maintain earlier and in chapter 9. 
One scholar says, presumably Jesus did not silence the beggar in contrast to chapter 8, verse 30, because he's at the threshold of Jerusalem where his messianic vocation must be fulfilled. The messianic secret is relaxed because it must be made clear to all the people that Jesus goes to Jerusalem as the Messiah and that he dies as the Messiah. Not the carpenter's son, not Jesus of Nazareth. He goes there as the Messiah and he dies as the Messiah. And in verse 49 and 50 of Mark 10, Jesus responded to the faith of this believer. Bartimaeus responds, verified his belief that Jesus could help him. Man's details emphasize Jesus' compassion, or Mark's details, I'm sorry, emphasize Jesus' compassion and this beggar's conviction. And Jesus' question allowed Bartimaeus to articulate his faith and through it, Jesus made personal contact with him. Rabboni is an emphatic personal form of rabbi, and it means my Lord and Master. Same word used in the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter and the 16th verse. When he's called Lord and Master, this word Rabboni occurs only here in Mark. It's called Rabbi in John 20, I believe it is. Jesus healed Bartimaeus instantly with a word attributing his healing to his faith. His faith was its means, not its cause. The Greek word translated made well is sasokin, which also means saved. Saved. Your faith has made thee whole or made you well. It means it saved you. What was happening in the man's body was really, we may presume, but the outward picture of what had happened in his soul. And the second stage in the progressive disclosure of Jesus' identity to the reader centers on his Davidic sonship. And what is noteworthy in this scene is that Bartimaeus, a person of great faith, appeals to Jesus as the son of David. Mm -hmm. And by granting Bartimaeus his request for sight, Jesus, in effect, accepts for himself the title, son of David. Mm -hmm. And moreover, he also shows how he fulfills the end time expectations associated with David. He does so not by donning the helmet of a warrior king, but by using his authority to heal and in this way to save. Bartimaeus responded appropriately and began following Jesus immediately, at least on the road to Jerusalem and perhaps as a disciple. Bartimaeus has been transformed from a helpless man who was going nowhere to a restored man who sets out on the road of discipleship. He began with the need, went on to gratitude, and finished with loyalty. And that is a perfect summary of the stages of discipleship. Bartimaeus pictured discipleship clearly. He recognized his inability, trusted Jesus as the one to give him God's gracious mercy. And when he could see clearly, he began to follow Jesus. This incident sets the stage for the climax of Mark's story. Jesus had finished his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. Some people, like Bartimaeus, were believing on and following Jesus. Others, like the religious leaders, did not believe. Conflict in Jerusalem was inevitable. That's our study for tonight. I want to close it with, with a song that I heard today. Mm entitled, Please Don't Pass Me By. As a matter of fact, this song gave me the idea to, to talk about blind Bartimaeus. It's sung by Fred Hammond, and, and the words go like this. There was a blind man on the roadside, and he heard a commotion. 
It was Jesus passing by with a crowd and it stirred his emotions. He'd been displaced his whole life, should he even try. Oh, don't bother Jesus. They say you have nothing. You have nothing to offer. Stay in your place. Right then he knew he had to choose. He had nothing to lose. So he cried, Jesus, Jesus, I need you. Please don't pass me by. He cried out, Jesus, I'm not ashamed to tell you I need you in my life. I need you in my life. I'm not much different from that man, and this is the honest truth. Could this sinful one with this messed up life, could I ever serve you? Oh, people and things clutter my mind, should I even try? Don't bother Jesus, they say you have nothing, you have nothing to offer, stay in your place. I must admit, when I think about it all, I need you in my life. So I cry, Jesus, Jesus, I need you. Please don't pass me by. I'm crying out, Jesus, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I need you in my life. As the deer, as the deer panted, thirsty for the water, thirsty for the water, my soul desires and longs to be, to be with you. Jesus, I need you, please don't pass me by. I don't mean to waste your time, but I can't listen to the crowd, situations in my life telling me to keep it down, but I need you. I know I'm broken, but you can heal me, Jesus. Jesus, I'm calling you. I might not be worth much, might not be worth much, but I'm still willing. Jesus, Jesus, I'm calling you. That song just resonated with me. You and I are just like that blind Bartimaeus. And I'll quote that through this lesson tonight or whenever you're watching, that you have heard a commotion about Jesus that he's passing by. When it comes to the matter of your salvation, you have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth through the Jew first and also to the Greek. You hear how he lived, died, and was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 through 6. And when you hear that, you must believe. Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, believe that he is the son of David. He is the son of God. He is the anointed one. He is the Christos. He is the Messiah. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. Be willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Be willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son, Matthew 10, verse 32. And then be willing to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16, 15, and 16, Galatians 3, 26, and 27, Romans 6, 3, and 4, 1 Peter 3, 21. Wherefore the baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. As Jesus is passing by in this message, why don't you call out to him? If you're a child of God and you have wandered away, cry out to him. Ask for mercy. And folks, the reason it's mercy is because God doesn't give us what we do deserve. And it's grace because he gives us what we don't deserve that's good. That's why it's called mercy. That's because it's grace, because we don't deserve his goodness, but he gives it to us anyhow. As a child of God, all you have to do, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you're a child of God, and with all of the commotion going on in our world and around us, sometimes the voice of Jesus may be cried out. 
or drowned out. And sometimes, somewhere in all this noise, a preacher of the gospel or a teacher of God's word or a brother and sister in Christ will give out a cry in the name of Jesus. And if you hear that cry, respond and ask him to strengthen and encourage you. Thank you for joining me in the study tonight. If you are a Christian, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Would you pray with me as I close in prayer? Gracious and eternal Father, take this message. Use it for your glory. I pray that I've lifted up Jesus Christ. And I declare the truth of what he said when he walked this earth. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Now I know he's talking about being lifted up on the cross. I tried to lift him up and lift him up on that cross on behalf of our sins. I pray that the saints of God have been encouraged, that they have been rejuvenated, and I pray that you would strengthen them. And I pray, Father, that those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, that you will take this word and convict them of the need to respond in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. Go with us as we dismiss ourselves from this platform. We know we're never out of your presence. Again, comfort those who are grieving the loss of loved one. Comfort our sick and our shut-in, our senior saints. Comfort all who are discouraged. Please bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.